that you should see some sort of a message. Okay, here we go. Okay, welcome to the session. Uh, a quick workshop webinar with Nikki Deem. She teaches social studies at Chardon Middle School. She's here to share best practices around how to manage uh, virtual classes and uh, kids that are in the classroom, connecting and working with kids that are home remotely and so on and so forth. Um, we did enable the Q&A. So for those of you that are in the webinar, if you click uh, up in the top right hand corner, you'll see kind of a listing of all the people that are here. And then there's a chat function. Uh, but then if you click on the activities tab, which is kind of like a square triangle circle, you'll see that there's a Q&A available for you. And so please put your questions in there. And if you see a question that uh, has already been asked, then you can just upvote it and then it'll kind of like rise to the top. And then um, I'll, I'll do my best to, to shoot those questions over to Nikki as she goes along. But um, we're here, we're excited. Nikki, take it away. And if you wanna share your screen, that's okay. Uh, but we're all yours. Awesome. Yeah, I will at some point, mostly because I took a screenshot of what my like Google Meet looked like today because I was thinking through what that looked like. Um, but yeah, like Andrea said, uh, my name is Nikki Deem. I teach seventh grade social studies. My schedule this year, I have four in-person classes when we're in person, but then I also teach a virtual class in the middle of the day because we gave our kids the option of in-person or virtual. Um, so it's all the same class. It's all seventh grade social studies, but in the middle of my day, I sit in my room with my door shut and teach virtually. Um, and all of our seventh grade, or we have one core teacher that does that for each each in each grade level for the different courses. Um, but then I also have, and coming back from break now, I'm at like 10, I think kids in quarantine. So we don't, um, I know there are some districts and I think this is kind of how you guys are talking about doing it with hybrid is that it's streaming your class per se while the kids aren't there. We're only using it for those quarantine kids. Um, so we're not doing it for the virtual kids. Those have been assigned separate courses in that sense. And we haven't been hybrid this year, so we haven't had the same schedule as you guys. Um, so Andreas just called me to kind of talk about what that looks like. Um, it took a while to figure out. We didn't actually have any cases or quarantine kids until October. So it was a smooth ride for a little bit, as smooth as it could be with like masks and shields. But um, but so once October hit, we kind of had to shift gears and think about what made sense. And the constantly emailing kids throughout the day was not working. And that was pretty frustrating. You know, I my schedule is bananas. I don't I eat lunch during my virtual class, so I can't respond to emails to kids, you know, during the day. I just don't have the time. And so it was pretty frustrating. And we had to kind of sit down and think what made sense um, and what worked with our union, because that's a you know, that's a part of that, too. And so what we kind of decided and it took a while and some things is that we have a lot of devices. I'm sure you guys are in the same boat. I have my desktop like I can. I'm going to move my camera here for a second. I have my desktop here that I you know, work off of. This is me. Normally I have my double screens, but then I also have a, a multitude of Chromebooks. So at my disposal. So it was kind of a working through that. And so I have my Chromebook here that I also have the meat on. So when I have quarantined kids in my room and I have them every period of the day, of course, I don't get a break in that aspect. I log into the meet two times and you yourself can be in a meet as many times on as many as devices as you need to. I found teaching virtually too. When I do breakout rooms, it's a lot easier to have more devices open and be in multiple rooms rather than switching in and out of rooms. That's been helpful for me too. Um, so I have this little Chromebook that I keep at the front of my room. So up by my smart board, I keep, or wherever my point of instruction is that day, I keep my Chromebook up there with my Google Meet open. On that Chromebook, I have my sound, my mic on. So, and I use a microphone too. I'm not sure if you guys have, like we use microphones too and they work. It's fine. I keep it on. The kids haven't given me any complaints about feedback or anything like that. So it's great for, cause talking through a mask, you can't, you can't not use the microphone, you know, for those in-person kids and neglect, neglect them as well. So I use the microphone. I have the computer up at the front on this computer, my main desktop computer that I'm on now, I also have the meet open. And this is where I share my screen. It's my reliable computer. I know it works. So if I have to run a Pear Deck or something, I want to run it off my desktop. And I share my screen so that on one screen, you saw that I had two monitors. On one screen, I have my Meet. On the other screen, I have what's projected to the board. And 
all the kids in the room can see that, whether they're virtual or they're in person, they all are seeing the same thing and they're hearing the same thing. And that I found was just what I needed to do. And a bunch of other teachers have started doing the same to make our lives easier and to make those kids feel included and a part of the class. Um, I joked with Andreas too. The other thing I do, like, you know, halfway through the class when you're done with your instruction and you're kind of ready to have the kids work independently, I'll jokingly ask the kids, okay, who wants so and so today? Because if it's only, you know, one kid, and I will hand my computer, my Chromebook to any kid in the room and it sits on their desk and they talk to that kid. And, you know, if that kid has questions, they let me know. And then it's kind of off my plate for a little bit, which is nice because then I'm not missing those in person kids because I'm so focused on the, the student in your case, the students that aren't there. So that's been fun is they love having their friends and it makes them feel like they're in class and they chat normally or work on their work. And, um, and that's been super helpful. Um, there's always tech things. There's some weird things, you know, you can't really play a video very easily. That feedback doesn't work. So sometimes if we're watching a short clip of something, I'll post the link in the chat for the students that are virtual. I'll have them mute me. They listen to the video on their own and then we come back together to discuss just like you would, you know, if you're watching a video in class with the other kids. You also can't have, at least this is how my system works, you can only clearly have one microphone on. If you have your microphone on on multiple computers, the feedback is going to be terrible. So you just have to play with your sound and make sure you figure out what works for you. Um, but those have been the really only big tech issues. Um, the kids seem to like this better. Whenever kids are quarantined, they always jump on the meet um, rather than wait for emails or try to get their work done without because it makes them feel included and it makes everything smoother for everyone. It's less work for you. It's less work for keeping track of, of who's missing and emails and all that. And it just, it seems to have been going well. Um, we're of course getting more and more kids every day added to it. So it's a little harder to manage now because I have to remember who's there. But for you with a hybrid situation, you know, every day it's similar kids, you know, every other day or however your your schedule is. So it'll be a lot easier, I would think, to manage in that case. Nikki, can you talk a little bit? Yeah, can you talk a little bit about how you um, you know, like the methodology or like sort of scheduling and and how do you communicate out with the kids? Like what do you post in classroom? Do you use Google Calendar? Where do they find the meet link? Like, how does that work for your kids? Right. So um, this took some playing too. We, um, I just actually removed all the kids today, but originally I had a meet link set up at the beginning of the year for um, all the kids in that class. And how you do that, you know, it. the best method for kids is, and let me, um, I think all my meets are going to be gone for the day because, but you know how when you go to meet.google.com and all your meets for the day are there if you've scheduled them? We made sure that that's how it looked for the kids too. So I'm going to share my screen because our meet is still up here in case you're not familiar with what that looks like. And so the way to do this is to send those calendar invites and you can make a calendar invite go throughout the whole year. And I'll show you my calendar here as well. Um, and that was huge for us because when we wanted the kids, you know, when we we were virtual the two weeks before winter break as well. And when we we wanted the kids to see, as you can see, I think it's there. Yeah, see on my screen here. Ours is the only one here. When our kids log in in the morning, if if they have meets that day, they'll have six meets lined up here on the on the thing because that's their schedule for the day. And so those quarantine kids know nothing's changed. They just know they need to log into that meet for the day. Um, if you look at Google Calendar, that's how we set those up. So you can see my calendar here has all the meets. These are each of my meets, the color codes there um, for each day. And if I click on one, um, I only have myself and the quarantine student right now on there because I removed all the other kids just so it didn't bog down their calendar. But when we were virtual, I had all the kids' names listed there. And when you type out all of the students' names, it's, and let me see if there's one where I don't have a, a name up, not that it matters, you guys are probably fine with that. But if you type out all of the students' names in the invite and you only have to do it the one time and then you move the meet, you move the calendar invite forward, that's how it shows up on their meet screen. If you don't, we found that if you don't type out their names and you just add it to Google Classroom or something, it won't show up on that meet.google.com screen. And that was really important to us so that 
it was one place they had to go. They could also access them from their Google Calendar, but this was the place we wanted them to be every morning. You go here, you see your schedule for the day. It's super easy to change. If we like, we did map testing from virtual when we were when we were before winter break. We had a different schedule that day. It's super easy to adjust those times that day, and the kids don't have to do anything different. They just have to go to meet.google.com, and all their meets for the day would show up. That's um, great. And so how you do that, if you, you have to make it set, you know, your time and you have to do the custom. Um, and I think I have a screenshot of this. I'll remember to try to send it to you, Andreas, if I have one of what you have to do to uh, make the calendar invite correct. This took some playing too. It was bonkers how long it took us to figure this out, but you have to do the custom link here. Oh um, yeah. 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 Sorry, and sorry, so sorry. that it's weekly on weekday. It was, it took us a while to figure it out, but we wanted to not yeah. have to play with it again. So, um, so yeah, every time I have a quarantine kid, I just add their name um, here. I add it to guest and they pops up. I don't send any emails. I, you know, I always uncheck the calendar invite. They don't need to see those. They just need it to be on meet.google.com. Um, and that's how we've that's how we've done that. And it's been really helpful and efficient. Whenever I get an email that someone's quarantined, I add their name to the list um, for all the future events. And then I delete it when they're when they come back. That's super cool. I, I certainly love the idea of having the kids kind of just going to, you know, meet that Google.com, see what they have, because then we could even short link that someplace. And, and now, right. do, you, do you ever use the link in Google Classroom then? Or so, is that not a functionality that you that you use? We, we could use that. It doesn't show up on meet.google.com. Yeah. And so we kind of wanted it to be a schedule. That was a big part of it was if they didn't see the schedule, we were concerned it wouldn't, they wouldn't just go when they were supposed to. Yeah. And so that we we had huge debates about this. It was it was a long process of what do we use and how do we do it? We've changed it a couple of times. But this has been the best. I have had no issues with kids knowing when they need to be somewhere. If a schedule changes, it, you know, they try to play the game where they think they don't know what they're supposed to do. But we're like, no, it was on meet.google. That's Good all luck. you need to do. You know, and we had to make it their homepage before they left us. It was their homepage. So, you know, an advisory before we left for winter break, it was their homepage. And so that's what they see every day. Yeah, that's, um, that's super cool. So, yeah, keep going. No, I just had one and I, did I email it? I had it on my, maybe I didn't hit send. Hold on. I'll find it in a second. I had a screenshot of what it looked like and I forgot when I had a student in there earlier. Oh, it's down here. Um, so real quick, I said this earlier, but this is what, well, of course it's not working right now. Um, this is what looks like. Sorry. Oh, here. So this is what it looks like for the student when I am on my Chromebook at the front or in, in my thing when I am doubly in, just so you can get a visual. Um, when I'm presenting my screen, that's what the presentation mode looks like. And then that's a student, the one that's names blocked out. I'm in there again. And then I always have my, I just have my camera on just so that the kids feel like they're in the classroom. But um, that's a screenshot just of what Meet looks like in that sense when you're, when you're in there twice and you're sharing your screen. I forgot to say that earlier, but. And we're, we're not seeing a screenshot, I don't think. I'll you're not. You. Well, of course you're not. We're seeing As I meet. say. <laughs> Guys, oh man. Oh, it's because I'm presenting a tab, not a window. This is the. Present my entire screen. I got it. So talk to you about that too. So if if anyone has seen uh, Nick at like a conference, maybe like the Google conference that we used to have in, in person, um, I always enjoy going to Nikki's um, sessions because her slides are off the hook. They're, <laughs> they're the best that I've ever seen. Um, so talk to us a little bit about some of that stuff, Nikki. Like where do you get um, you know slide templates? What what's your workflow in terms of preparing stuff for this instruction? We're, look at that. I mean, there we go. That's that's fire right there. So I've I've made my whole building do this. This is a mandated, Nikki D mandated you to do this. I made them all for them in the summer. We got a new website this summer. So I was like, no, everyone has to do this. This is what it's going to look like. So um, the Google Calendar, if you don't know, you can embed slides onto a website and you don't ever have to go to the website ever again. You just change your slide and it changes automatically. And it is the it has saved and all of my teachers' time and energy, and it also saves me the headache of giving people access to edit websites because I don't like to do that. I'm a control freak. So um, so this has saved us a lot of stress of helping people. And so I have two different calendars, one for my in-person kids, one for my virtual. But we were actually hybrid the first week of school. So 
filled, the one week we had hybrid. So this is what my hybrid calendar looked like. Um, and I know that you, we were doing different lessons for those kids, so it may not make sense for your calendar to look like this if you're actually doing the lessons with the students. Um, but I had a group A and a group B row, and the group A, the gray days were the days that they were in school. The non-gray days were the days that they were home. Um, and I wrote in person online to make it less hectic, but I just embed these calendars on our CMS website and I can actually show you our CMS webpage. And that saves me and all of my teachers so much planning time and hectic of how do we communicate information? Those are available for parents. I also have it linked at the top of my Google Classroom. So there are zero excuses about, you know, what you're supposed to be doing that day um, for those teachers. So this is what our website looks like. And again, I said it's new this year. So if you go to my name, you can scroll and see contact information and then my two embedded calendars. And I have one for my in-person and then my virtual kids know that they have to scroll a little bit. And their calendar is almost the same, but they have a little less time. So, um, and you throw so there's the in the chat so we can go there and noodle around. Sure. After. <clears throat> and this is yes. public public facing. Right. So like parents yep. can see it. Kids can for see sure. It. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it is public here. I'll put the link here. Um, and yes, it is available to anyone. Um, and yeah, there's my other calendar. So I have a little bit different colors just so I can know which is which and the kids know as well. Um, some of my teachers teach like my friend, Mrs. Culleton share teaches two language arts classes, but she has them virtual and in person. So in a sense, she kind of has four preps. So she has four calendars. So if you scroll on her. She has, you know, all of her information here um, and she's got all of her calendars there as well, but you can link things on there. So it is super simple. You can link directly to Google Classroom assignments if that's how it works for you. Um, but yeah, you can, this has saved us. And again, I've pretty much made every person in my building do this because it's just easy for parents to access, easy for kids to see and organize. And then it makes everything really uniform across, across the school, which has been super helpful. So it sounds like the whole middle school sort of uses the same format, which is simple then. Can you, uh, yeah. you tell us a little bit, we talked, uh, Nikki, about that you did sort of your, your course that you did virtually in the fall semester. Talk to, about, talk to us about some of those things that you learned, like what worked, what didn't work so well, timing, you we talked a little bit about pace. Yeah, I have 20 minutes less with those kids than I do my in-person kids. And that already is the first boundary. I also have 35 kids in that class. And so... Those two barriers have been difficult to manage and I've had to just cut and cut and cut and realize it's okay to do that as long as I'm still hitting those standards. And I'm seventh grade social studies, if anyone is familiar, has 21 standards. Like I'm not, I'm not hurting. It's the other teachers I worry about that I know are hurting a little more. Um, but it definitely has been an adjustment to time to, you know, I, I transitioned to almost using Pear Decks exclusively if you're a Pear Deck fan, because I can see what the kids are doing in real time. I had at the beginning of the year, I was assigning a Google slide here to do, or, you know, a Google drawing and realizing that I had to open each of them individually to see what the kids are doing in the moment. And I felt like I was missing kids not working because it was so hard for me to get those open. I found with Pear Deck or something like Nearpod, it's so much easier in the moment to see everyone on one screen and what they're accomplishing um, and call out that kid that, you know, maybe isn't filling in their slide because I can literally see right there that they're not doing it. Um, so that's been a huge thing. Um, but then it's been nice because I've kind of transitioned those Pear Decks to in-person too and realized it's super quick for me to get that formative data from my in-person kids as well. So it's yeah. been a little easier to not, I'm not duplicating as much work as I thought I was going to have to as the year started, but that's been super helpful. Um, I, I, on that calendar, I have it split because those kids have less time. So I have a, what we're doing in class together and then what I'm expecting you to do on your own outside of class for the next day. Um, and they don't always have something like this week. They have two times they have something that they need to do outside of class because we just don't have time to do it together. And it's stuff that they can do independently. Um, I just don't have the same time with them. So I've had to split and rework that calendar. I call it live Google Meet session versus on demand outside of class. Um, and they have time in their day. Their day is much different than our in-person kids. So they have time that they can do those things. I'm not I'm not bombarding them with extra work in that sense. But that was something I had to kind of overcome is just cutting things and doing differently. You know, I, I'm just starting to feel like I know those kids 
some of those kids. I don't, I don't know many of like them really ha- the same as I do my in-person. And that's just the reality of a virtual teaching, I think, because you don't get to know those kids as well. Um, but I've also realized that I just have to take some time to do things that help me get to know them because I just am not able to ask them the same questions that I ask kids in class. The conversation doesn't flow the same. Um, they all have their cameras off and I don't even know what some of them look like. <laughs> yeah. you know, I can ask them to turn their cameras on, but they don't. And that, that's the yeah. reality. And I'm not going to make them. It is what it is. But um, I joke with them that sometimes I'm talking to a, you know, black box and it's so boring, but it works. Let's do some questions. We have some questions here. So uh, yes. Kathy asked uh, earlier, uh, what kind of microphone do you have? Um, and I'm, I'm assuming Kathy, that was for like the in, in the building, which is the same. Yeah. Person. It connects to our speakers. Um, we just recently, we only had them in some classrooms and we just recently got them in all, thank goodness, because it's been a lifesaver talking through the mask and yeah. all that business. But you don't have, that sounds like you don't have a separate mic to sort of connect to the Google Meet. You no, I, my camera that I showed you, the, the camera above my desktop here has a microphone oh, on it. Yeah, so. and that's enough that you find that that's yeah, enough. Because yeah. these, I have headphones in and they are not mic'd. That's my yeah. mic. So okay. it's work. Yeah, it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. John has a question about Pear Deck. Are you using your Pear Decks in the student paced mode if the students are at home online? Depends on, I switch back and forth. So in Pear Deck, you can switch between teacher pace and student pace. So I usually start it as teacher pace, do a few slides, depending on what it is. Um, and then if it's something I want them to work on individually, I can flip it to student paste. Um, when we're done with a Pear Deck, I always flip it to student paste and add it to classroom just to save it for later. Rather than do the student takeaways, if you know what that is, I find I found that just too much for me and them. So I just post it to classroom and they can always access it later. Um, but yeah, I flip back and forth just depending on what the instruction is, what what the need is for that, for that lesson. And just to reiterate, so... Oh, I guess my question for you, Nikki, do you, you have Pear Deck, the sort of the premium version, the paid I version? I fought for that. We got a grant for yeah. it this year because I, I I went to my, we didn't budget it in over the summer. And then they added all these new features this summer. They added the teacher feedback and a couple of things. Yeah. And I was like, we can't live without this. And so we kind of had to bombard our assistant superintendent after thousands a month, thousands of dollars have been spent on all these other things we needed. And yeah. so we ended up getting a grant for it to cover us through October, but we will put it in our budget. My principal already said for next year, cause we're realizing I I'm the admin and I can see how many teachers are using it. And it's incredible. I mean, it, it's amazing. So that's so awesome. at Streetsboro, for those of you that are in a cult, we do have the premium version as well. We, we went with sort of a district package. So if you're not using it and you're wondering what, what Nikki's even talking about, we have it. And Dan, who's with us today would be more than happy to, to spend some time with you to get the Pear Deck going. It's an amazing tool, but we did see, we did have a conversation the other day that if, you know, if we're seeing not as much use, then maybe we spend our money elsewhere. So it's one of those things where like, not kind of use it or lose it, but I mean, good tools cost a little bit of money. So, all right, another yeah, question. Andres, right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'll, I'll add on to that really quick. We are, one of the 30 minute Wednesday sessions we're doing the afternoon session is going to be an intro to Pear Deck. So, if you haven't had time to look at the videos and things that were sent when we did get the license, um, we're going to do like a 30 minute crash course. That, so like if, if you're not sure of what, you know, Nikki was talking about with the student pace versus teacher pace and the difference, like we're going to go over all that, how to link it to, you know, build it in your Google slides um, and then get that feedback uh, back. So we will go over that too. But in the meantime, I am more than happy to pop over and show you. Great. As, and, as I'm sure Dan will say, they have so many good videos too. Like they, you yeah. can find any yeah. video. They're awesome about their PD, which is great. I just said this. I don't know what PD it was the other day, but I just said this the other day that their YouTube channel, if you just go to YouTube and follow the, and, and look at the Pear Deck, their actual channel, it is just, it's like one and two minute videos too. They're real short. They're right to the yeah, point. They're awesome. Um, they're super easy to follow. So yeah, I totally agree. So here's a math question from Katie, uh, who teaches math at our middle school. She says, when you teach from a Pear Deck, do you open it as a student to write on it or or use another item to actually write and show things, thinking of showing a math problem? Both. It depends on what I'm doing. So if we're doing some kind of notes and I've transitioned that into a Pear Deck, I will open it as a student and fill it in. And then I have the key and I attach mine, you know, I save it and attach it to the kids too, so they can see it later. Um, so typically I'll do that. Sometimes I have them in a Pear Deck and then I have another presentation open that they're following along with. Totally depends on what it is, but I have absolutely been in as a student before and and done that because um, I find that them seeing me modeling it is definitely helpful and, and works well for them to, to write it down as well. 
Let's jump back. I, I typed this in earlier, but I can you tell us more about, uh, you were saying you're teaching the black box because the kids won't turn yeah. the camera on. Can you talk to us more about your experience there and, and, and sort of the engagement piece? And, and more importantly, what, what do you do when, when like there's nothing? It's just a black box and it's struggling. Um, when it's a black box and I've called their name six times, I have not been afraid to just call a parent in the moment. I, the kids have seen me on the phone. I'll mute my computer and I call. I did that a couple times at the beginning <laughs> of the year more to just like, Make sure they knew I meant business. I was not going to play around. Like you chose this path. You know, if we were all virtual and it was a different story and people didn't choose that, that's one thing. Those kids I teach chose that path with their parents and or someone in their house chose that path for them. And so I'm expecting them to work. So I've, I've done a few of those. Um, I have my about seven kids every day of my 35 that are disengaged. I caught one kid the other day. This is epic. I He didn't know his camera was on. I, I jokingly asked him to turn their camera on and he must have done it. And he left it on. And all of a sudden I get an email from a kid in the class and I just didn't have the meet up for a moment. And she said, Mrs. Deem, so-and-so is playing Xbox in class. And I was like, what? And I go back to the meet and this kid is sitting there with his Xbox controller like this. And he's got the computer up. And I just called his mom. Right, I was like, you have got to be kidding me. And she was, you know, of course, livid and, I got many apology emails and he got a call from the assistant principal, yada, yada. But, you know, we've had a really hard time keeping, I feel like I'm at a good place now. First semester was rough of keeping those kids engaged. I had so many parent conversations about, you know, them trying to get their kid to work and do stuff. I'm like, again, you chose this. Like, we're trying to help you as much as you can, but I don't see their screen. And that was also why the paradox started coming into play, because it did allow me to basically see their screen. Do I know if they're doing something else on the side? I don't. Although I have caught many a kid doing an ed puzzle during my class because the science teacher has come in and said, you know, so-and-so is doing an ed puzzle for me right now. And then it explodes. But, um, you know, those kids are going to make their choices. I feel like we can do our best and try to engage kids as much as we can. We can use those tools like Pear Deck to make sure we're doing on our part and keeping up with them. But there's going to be those kids that don't pay attention if it comes to that they're failing, that's another thing. And that obviously requires intervention. But in the moment, you know, I have 35. It's hard to keep up with them. But I try to look at as many of their things they're submitting as I can. Um, today, they did an ed puzzle for me while we were kind of meeting with kids individually. There were about seven kids that hadn't started it. By the time I came back halfway through, called them out in the meet right away, said their names, and they got right in. I don't know what they were doing for those 20 minutes. I'm never going to know. But it, yeah. it is what it is. And, you know, as long as we're doing tools that we can kind of see what they're doing in the moment as quick as we can, I think that's the best thing we can do for ourselves. Do you, uh, do you take time? Do you schedule individual conferences with these kids? Like you might sort of in real life? Where you I have you know? not as much as I'd like, as I wish I could. Again, I only have 40 min minutes with them. By the time they're all in, it's probably 35. Um, and I've lost the last two minutes because they go straight to science for me. So it's probably 33 in the end. So I don't, Always. I've done it a couple times this year. I wish I could do it more. Um, but again, I have 35 and it's really hard to find time. I'd get five. I get through five a day. I'm a talker. So I would be terrible. But I have done some, especially with those kids that need it. Breakout rooms are great for that if they're working, even meeting with maybe a couple kids at a time. If you want to try to knock out a few, that's been super helpful. Uh, when kids have questions, I pull them in and then try to engage them in other topics too, which is helpful. Um, but yeah, I wish I had more time to do that. I should make more time to do that. But the breakout rooms definitely help with that with that feature for sure. And so you're saying breakout rooms in Google Meet? Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so you can pull a kid immediately. Um, let me see. I'm going to share. Let me yes. join this. I don't know if I can. Well, I'm going to try. This might explode. Hold on. Here we go. The sound might go crazy. We'll see. Oh, we'll get 10,000 screens. Yeah, I'm going to mute it, but we'll see. Um, just so you can see that process here. Um, if you haven't done it before, it's super easy. You guys will see something pop up on your screen. So you'll. Oh, I'm hearing it twice. Let me mute the tab. <laughs> there we go. OK, so now I should be good. Um, so obviously seeing the meet here um, wait, wait, twice, wait, wait, but if go. I go to activities, did everyone see what, what Nikki just did, by the way? Did oh, you guys even know that that was available? Yeah, I know. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. It was just she That's muted the work. tab, which was it's a great trick. Here we go. Yeah. Except it muted it on both of them. I'm not sure why. So okay. I'll just hear myself for a minute. That's okay. Um, so you click breakout rooms. 
And this is the teacher and, but you'll also see it. Am I not the host? You are not the host. That's, I can't do it. So you'd have to do it. But, I but do. of course I'm not the host, but if you click that, it's really easy. It just um, asks you, it, it'll do it automatically. So if it will assign rooms, if you want them assigned, you can move the kids around. So if you can predetermine the rooms, you can do that as well. Um, and you can edit the rooms at any time. Can, so, I dem can I demo, Nikki? Please, please do. Yeah. And it's awesome because those kids go in and out. You can close the rooms at any time and the kids will jump back to this. It's called the main call. Um, and yeah, it's it's awesome. It's been really helpful. They didn't have it until, you know, November or something. So that was frustrating and we kind of had to drive again and figure it out. But, um, but yeah, if you watch Andreas there, he's going to hit breakout rooms and so you guys can at least see teacher. Yep. I go to my top right hand corner, click on that uh, triangle square. I go to breakout rooms and this is a good call to demo because we have about 20 people in here. If I then say just here, you see everyone that's in the call. And then I just say set up breakout rooms. I can say five, four, three, two, one and see how it kind of automatically just adds people random or if you then wanted mrs devers up here you just drag and drop and you can make your own rooms you can set a timer you know end breakout rooms after x amount of minutes you can shuffle you can clear you can do whatever you want it's very very simple and then we're not going to go into it now but once you do that uh it's very simple to then kind of as a um host of the meeting jump in between rooms so you could create five breakout rooms and then walk in between each room and kind of get an idea of what you're doing. Yeah, it's wonderful. And in that screen too, one of the things I didn't learn till later, which is just little things that you're like, what? You can name the breakout rooms so you can change the name of them, which I just, I really don't have a purpose to, but I got excited to learn that I could do that. And then you can also just type the name of someone that's in the room. So if you're really far down in that screen, it's hard to move them sometimes. They don't move as nice. You can type a name and it pops up, just like if you were sending someone an email. Um, so that was helpful too. little tricks like that. Just help make it go faster as you're, that's the one thing is trying to make the rooms quick. If you do want them set is, is harder. Sometimes you have to let the kids talk amongst themselves while you make them, but the shuffle is nice and, and super efficient if you want to go that route. All right. Let's talk about what isn't working, Nikki. So what, like, what do you wish would be different? What, what are some things that are super frustrating? What um, uh, do, you, do you want more support from your district on? It's and you don't have to name any names or like call anyone. I'll out call them out. Don't worry. <laughs> just, you're, you're here, so we can fix it. Um, I would. I would say for me personally, I, I have too many kids in my virtual class, and that's just a nature of the schedule. It actually, I actually had two virtual classes the first quarter, and then we have gave kids option to come back, and we had eight kids come back, and so then my schedule, I had to add an in person class. So that's just my own. But 35 kids, I found, I thought it would be fine. It is fine, but it's hard to manage. It's hard to keep on track with those kids in just that small window of time that you have with them. And it just happens that my plan is when they have another class. So I can't even meet with them at a time that made sense outside of my 40 minutes. So that's all I get. So that's frustrating for me. Um, we, we did give the kids and the families options to move back and forth. And I don't I, th I think for them, that's great. For, you know, you have to do what's best for your family. Schedule wise, it's been a nightmare because it's just migrating so much. Our quarter ends next week and I'm going to get another new schedule because we've got tons of families. We're in person, obviously. We've got tons of families that are like, no, we're not going anymore. We're going to go virtual. So that's going to be a bit of a mess. But I mean, more logistics stuff. I think we're doing as best as we can with for the kids. I wish I could provide them more, you know, social emotional lessons and things like that to get to know them better. Um, it's just the nature of the timing and how it's working. Um, but overall, honestly, I was very, as I'm sure all of us were this year has been crazy and it continues to be crazy, but I think it's going as well as it can. You know, I, the quarantine kid situation threw us for a loop. We figured it out. The virtual kids, you know, you figure it out and it's all difficult, but thank goodness I'm teaching the same subject I've been teaching for a while because I, feel for right. those people that have migrated or are doing something new because I would be over, I would just be drowning if that were the case for me. So I am blessed in that sense. And if any of you are in that boat, I'm, I hope it goes well for you. And I'm, I'm sorry if that is frustrating, but, um, but yeah, it, it, it's been fine. <laughs> fine. What about, uh, what about equipment and stuff? Is there something that you wish that you had or didn't have or access to an app or 
You we got what? this set up, the camera and stuff. I didn't have this at the beginning of the year. I didn't have a double desktop or a, a double monitor. And that made all the difference. I, I cannot believe I was teaching with my one monitor and that I had multiple Chromebooks open just so I would have more access to the kids that the kids couldn't see or, you know, what I was doing. Um, we got the cameras and the mics and that has been huge for us. Um if we hadn't gotten Pear Deck, I would definitely have said Pear Deck, but really, we also own Ed, we also pay for Edpuzzle, which is huge um, because we can have unlimited videos. But um, otherwise, I feel pretty good right now. There's nothing that I'm like, man, I can't believe we're working without that. How are we doing this? Um, maybe some more sanitizing spray, but that's like, you know, that is what it is. <laughs> I bother with that a lot. <laughs> yeah. I have to ask the custodians, where is it? I just need to fill it myself. I'm like running out all the time, but um, yeah. But no, I think technologically, you know, we made it that way. We, all the teachers now just got these cameras like we worked through it this year. They, they didn't have them at the beginning. So it's been a learning curve and, a you know, go figure it out as we go. Um, and it's working as much as it can work, I guess. And now we'll have this equipment forever, which is good in case we ever have a situation like this again. Or, or if we continue teaching virtual, it would not surprise me if we kept that up to keep our students in our district versus, you know, going elsewhere. So. What about, um, I, I have some more questions, I guess. I'm curious. So, yes. do you, so we're recording this Google Meet so that we can mm -hmm. keep it later. Do you record your lessons and then just throw them in classroom? I do not. I thought about it, but, you know, it was, it, our, I think our, our principal, we had this discussion too, and it was also like, we don't want to give kids the crutch not to come. Mm -hmm. You know, being sick or something, that's one thing. You know, if you're not there that day, I totally understand. But I, it's one of those things like I want those kids there every day because that's when we all learn best when we're working together. If they're just watching a video, my husband teaches online school for Ohio Connections Academy. That's the kind of school they want if they just want to watch a video, you know, and, and do that lesson on their own. They're in school with us and I want them there as much as I can. So I don't do that. I post everything to classroom by day. I mean, by a date. I have the date, the day. I have emojis. Yeah, I have emojis. Uh, these are my, if you haven't done groups, oh, I'm not pressing my screen, hold on. Um, if you haven't done groups also, this is huge um, in Google Class or in a, in Chrome. I love grouping my tabs and they stay like this all the time. So you can see my different core groups at the top. They're color coded. So I can keep all those classrooms open all the time, which is huge. Um, the other big thing that I have is a today tab in Google Classroom. That has been huge. And a lot of our teachers have migrated to that as well. So I have a today topic in Classroom. Whatever we're doing that day and anything they need for the day is in that today topic. And then like at the end of today, I would move this down to this week's topic. Um, and then tomorrow's stuff would be under today. Um, Anything that isn't in a topic goes automatically to the top. So that calendar that I showed you all is at the top there. And that's the only thing I have there. I don't want to bog down the, the classroom. Um, but that's been super helpful is having having it organized by date. So I always put the date there. My emojis, that means it's a pair deck. Obviously, the 100 means it's something that's assessed. Um, so they know, especially it's an assignment that needs done. Um, but yeah, that's been really helpful. And then you can just scroll down and see I've got you know, backlog of, of weeks there of things that, you know, that they've been working on and they can always access it again. But, but yeah, I find that I didn't need to record them. I don't think anyone in my building records their meets daily. Um, but everything's in classroom and, and, and on the calendar. So it's like, you can't give them more information about where, where things are and what they need to be doing that day, parents or students. So, um, so I found it's, it's pretty slick to do it this way. Um, but I know there are other people that, that probably do something similar or um or do record their meets i'm not sure do you uh do you have uh do you run discussions in the stream like will you post a question or or just sort of google classroom it's less related to remote instruction but i just i'm curious about what you do in your google yeah classroom. i do questions sometimes um if we're doing a question uh, so we do achieve 3000 which is a reading program um and they have a poll question and, and social studies does it i teach social studies and we do it every week so we've kind of taken that from language arts and started that literacy in our class um and the poll question when you do it in achieve it doesn't show the results to all the kids. So I always add the poll question to classroom or when we are virtual to Google Meet so that they can see the results, which I like. Um, so I do that, but most of the time our discussion if we're in person is gonna happen, you know, with us talking. And I don't 
they don't do anything outside of class for me, my in-person kids. So there's nothing they're doing outside of class that they would need to do at home or have a discussion on. Um, but I have used it before. I don't, I don't use it much. Um, I have comments on, but they don't really comment, but I do use the private comment feature a lot to kids and they get the, we, we set their email notifications for the kids. You can change your notifications for classroom. So I had the kids change their notifications so that they always get an email when they get a comment. So they know to go look at something. Um, but we had them turn off like you don't need to know every time an assignment's posted. You'll get emails forever if that was the case. We had them turn that off. Um, but the private comments is great because it really is almost a private conversation between you and the kid as long as they remember to check them. <laughs> they don't always, <laughs> but they try. Show us this grouping tab. I, I'm wondering if you get free mm. free resources for Google Chrome because my mine would crash immediately if I had that many tabs open. But it's my desktop. I'm telling you, this desktop it's newer, newer, and I, I couldn't do it on my Chromebook. Although I did it on my Mac when we were virtual and it was fine. But yeah, um, yeah when you want to group a tab, so these are already grouped. All you have to do, let's say I want to group um, group this tab here. I'm going to right click, and you can hit Add Tab to Group. Those already exist, so I could add it to one of those. I can also drag it. So if one of them is open, you can drag it and it automatically, you'll see the color loops over top of it. And that means it's going into that group. But I can also do it manually. If I wanna start a new group, I go to add tab to group and hit new group. And I'll just say test and you change the color um, and it makes a new little group there and you can drag anything into it that you want. Um, those stay open all the time for me. When I shut down my computer, I don't close my windows. I just shut it down so then they reopen magically when I turn my computer on. Oh. So my groups, my groups are always there, um, which is great because then I don't have to set them. And I only have their classroom in there. And usually like if they're doing something, their Paradex, I'll put their Paradex in there so that I have them open and I don't have to continuously open them from Paradex, um, that kind of thing. But it's helpful because I just don't bounce back and forth as much um and then i keep my pin tabs up there that you know the things that they're gonna that i need every day so yeah love it let's yeah. uh do you mind we take some questions from the from the crew that's here if you if you have a question just you know unmute yourself maybe raise your hand use the google classroom feature we talked about that down in fifth grade today just sort of you know tell your kids that there's a raise hand functionality and then all you do is you click it and then you're the meeting host will get a notification that says you know dan stitzel is raising his hand dan you want to try it Let's do it. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> it pops up. And so if you have a question, let us know. I do know, Inger, you had a question. I saw your hand was up at one point. I don't know if you still have your question or not, but I know that was a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> She's playing with the hand feature. You're fine. <laughs> yeah. Testing it. You can also unraise those kids' hands, which is nice. Um, sometimes they forget. So if you're the host, you can um, unraise their hands up in the bar there, which is helpful because sometimes there's so many hands up and I have to just shut them all off and say, do you actually have a question? Do it again, please, because sometimes there's too many. Any questions from the field? We know it's getting late in the day. We're super appreciative of your time. Um, how much time would you say, Nikki, you spend on um, like teaching the kids how to use the, the stuff or are they pretty self-sufficient by the time they get to you? At this point, they're getting more self-sufficient. We've, this is year six with Chromebooks for all kids. And so, you know, they've had a good base of, of that coming to me. Um, that's, I consider that part of my job though, is to teach them those tools. So we'll do new stuff. Like we'll do a Google drawing and I'll spend 20 minutes showing them all the drawing tools so that we can do that together. Um, Cause I think it's important for them to, to get that and they just don't always get it. And sometimes we just assume they know how to do something and we find quickly that they don't. And then we have to kind of circle back. Um, so we, you know, we do lessons they're doing and we have advisory in the morning and they are doing the, Oh gosh, I'm not going to get the name at um, the Google where they become applied. certified. What, what is it, Dan? The applied digital skills. Yes. The applied digital skills. Thank you. So we've signed them up for that. It went a little wayside when we knew we were going to go virtual and we started hounding them with all this other stuff and scheduling, but, um, but we're going to get back to that. Um, applied digital skills is awesome because you just sign assign lessons. You don't have to do anything and they learn new Google stuff through doing rather than just watching. So that's, yeah. that's a fun thing. And it links like right to classroom now, like super yeah. easy. You, you used to have to like pick and choose. Now it's just like awesome. send it to classroom, send it to classroom. Yeah. I know Missy Payton, a, she does that. We yeah, have a seventh grade Google classroom for all of our seventh graders. So we just push it out that way. And it's so slick because then I, all the other teachers don't have to do anything. I just push it out and, and yeah. they do it. So that's been helpful. Kathy has a, Kathy raised her hand. Kathy. 
Hi, Nikki. Thank you so Hi. much for doing this. Of course. Um, my question is, like, when you have kids virtually because they're quarantined or whatever, how much time do they spend live with you before you send them off on your own? Like, do you do like a mini lesson and then they're gone or do you keep them with you the whole time or... It totally depends on what we're doing. Today, they I they had a, a quick ed puzzle to do, and then they were working on highlights in their Achieve Literacy article. And I had a kid in every class on the quarantine computer. And I said, you know, I'd like for you to stay until those things are done. If they get done, I'll look really quick, and then you can go. And most of them finished early. Those kids that were staying in class, we were doing like little trivia questions and other stuff. And I told the kids, if you want to stick around, you can. Most of them were like, no, I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> so um, I think it just depends. I have found, and this is a, a big thing, I think, with my virtual kids and these quarantine kids. If you let them go before you have gotten what you want from them, there's a 50% chance you won't get it. <laughs> so in the beginning of the year with my virtual kids, I would say, okay, guys, you have an ed puzzle to do. Why don't you guys just go work on your own and I'll see you tomorrow. And they would just go eat lunch. And I was like, no, no, no. I meant like right now, like go do it so I can watch you. And so I found I have to keep them in the meat the whole time that they belong to me. If we get done early, that's one thing. But I, I did find pretty early on that if I let them go, I'm not getting what I need from them. And then it's just more tracking and, they don't have it done for the next day and then we can't move on in our lesson and there's you know a lot of things so so i think getting what you need from them and what you expect from them is important before you just send them on their way so we're setting up our expectations to send out to students and parents mm -hmm. so like if we say this is our scheduled time for language arts we expect your child to be in the time in the meet during this time and then daily we could say maybe this day they don't have to stay as long maybe the, the yeah. next day so that's that's how we're trying to do it I, yep. Our wording, our wording was almost the same. It was, you are required to come to the meet. And our meet, our virtual schedule was our normal schedule. We didn't mm -hmm. change it. So okay. we said, you're required to come to the meet at this time, unless your teacher, uh, per teacher discretion or something along those lines. And and they had to be there. And then we could let them go if, if we were done and they didn't need to be there anymore. Okay. And some kids I kept longer because they maybe didn't have a class. And I was like, oh, you want to say we can finish it now? And they would do it. And I would say, great. Right. <laughs> so it's dependent. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Yeah, great questions. Who who else? What questions do you have for Nikki? Because we only have her for another two minutes. And then we're going to wrap up. I just want to comment, too. And this is what... when. I saw this via Twitter, like Nikki tweeted back at something I posted. And this is, I think what sparked this whole conversation. But the one thing you keep saying is the quarantine computer. And I love this idea. <laughs> and it was and like, this is, I, I tell, told Andreas, I'm like, Nikki said this. And I think that's why, you know, he was like, I'm going to reach out to her. But the idea <laughs> of having the other students in the class, like, like when those kids are at home virtual, having, you know, a student like liaison almost or a student like teacher's aide who, yeah, who is like, when there's a kid at home that has a question, you're going to be walking around helping the other students in the class as well. But that student can say, hey, like, you know, Sammy at home has a question. So it kind of takes that weight off of you of constantly having to look at your right. own computer screen or hearing them in your earbud, you know, like it, it's really, I think that's such a cool idea. And I think too, like I was thinking, I'm like, it puts a little responsibility on maybe one, like those students that need to focus a little more in class. Now they're focusing maybe a little bit more because they don't want to, you know, they don't they don't want to make it so that the kids at home aren't getting something out of it too so i i loved that idea so yeah that, i was that doing the headphone harder. thing for a bit dan and then i was like why am i doing this why am i the only one hearing them and i think i thought there would be this weird feedback and it wouldn't sound good and once i got that figured out i was like no no this is not on me anymore <laughs> it's like yeah, same thing was, i was like the kids yeah. need it and it, it works way better and they they enjoy it so i, I just I thought of them. like the kids in my own class who needed a little more ownership. I'm like, there you go. Like that is yeah. such an easy way to like get them involved and like yeah. to have some of that ownership. So hats, I love that idea. And half the Thank time you. it's their friends and they just want to talk to them. And I'm like, that's fine, yeah. but do your work. And they do. And I'm yeah. like, great. <laughs> yeah, it works. Awesome. And it is my computer. I don't have like control issues in that sense. Like, yes, it's my computer. And I also don't care. So <laughs> no kid has hurt my computer or hacked my account yet in, in that, but hopefully fingers crossed that it just streaks it. Inger, Inger Barnes has a question for. Yes, sorry, my I have to use my phone and my Chromebook at the same time because the Chromebook sound doesn't work. Um, anyway, um, my brand new one, by the way. Um, uh, my question is like when you are doing the virtual or the hybrid, 
And would you do a teacher liaison for the same thing for like the kid, like all the kids that are um, also working? Because if I'm helping someone across the room, their hands raised and I don't. And I talked to them about that today, too. I'm like, I don't want anyone shouting out, Mrs. Barnes, help me. Like, you know, so like, how do you manage that one as well? I haven't had like the max number of kids that I've had in the meet that I've managed is probably four with the kids in person. It's not quite the same situation as you guys. Um but I think as long, I think it's important to remember that when those kids are in person, and I hate to say like one is more important than the other, but when those kids are in person, those are the kids that are there in the moment and the other kids are coming the next day. You know, you're getting those kids. So I think making sure you're paying attention to those in-person kids, like you said, working with someone across the room, that's your day to do that. And those in those online kids, I think giving them to a, I'd like student liaison, that was a great phrase, Dan, is is a great idea because they can maybe field questions. And what if that kid has a question, but the liaison could answer it and you don't have to, you know, I don't know. I think there's, that's huge. Have them use the chat feature a lot. I think that's important. Um, I tell them sometimes from across the room, I can see if the chat has changed versus a raised hand. That raised hand thing is pretty tiny. Um, so sometimes I'll just notice the chat. Again, if a, if a kid can answer their question, I let them do it versus, and then if I can't, then I'll go over and help. But I think, it, you know, I don't want to put say necessarily you have to put priority on one kid or the other. They're all your kids. But those in-person kids, they need you in that moment because they're not going to have you the next day and vice versa. So I think it's important, like you said, to really focus on them. And if you can use that student liaison to do those questions and et cetera, I think that I think that's huge if, if you can make it work. But yeah, I haven't had the number of kids that you will have in that situation because we haven't been full hybrid yet. Yet. <laughs> Anything can happen. That's right. Anything. Yep. Other questions, other questions for Nikki, or or we're gonna or we're gonna uh, wrap it up. I think because it's about four o'clock, and and I, I, there's so much that I have to just sit, sit down and think about, Nikki. So now, there, like you've shown us all kinds of things that I hadn't even thought about today. So I and love. David, Andreas has my email. If anyone needs anything, please. I'm. I can answer anything or, or Dan, you know, however you want to get in contact with me. If you think of something and you have a question about how to make it work. Um, but yeah, whatever you need. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Of do you course. drink coffee, Nikki? You coffee drinker? <laughs> I do, but you don't know me anything. Okay. Okay. It's not. <laughs> I just, I make sure, make sure. Is Molly on here? I didn't see Molly. Molly's like, Molly's a tea person. So I gotta, you know, I gotta ask. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Uh, thank this you all. Thank you, Nikki. Recorded, so we'll share it out with everyone and, and have a great day and have a great rest of your week. Yeah, you as well. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Thank